The Clock That Went Backward by Edward Page Mitchell A row of Lombardy poplars stood in front of my great-aunt Gertrude's house on the bank of the Sheepscot River. In personal appearance, my aunt was surprisingly like one of those trees. She had the look of hopeless anemia that distinguishes them from fuller-blooded sorts. She was tall, severe in outline, and extremely thin. Her habiliments clung to her. I am sure that had the gods found occasion to impose upon her the fate of Daphne, she would have taken her place easily and naturally in the dismal row, as melancholy a poplar as the rest. Some of my earliest recollections are of this venerable relative. Alive and dead, she bore an important part in the events I am about to recount, events which I believe to be without parallel in the experience of mankind. During our periodical visits of duty to Aunt Gertrude in Maine, my cousin Harry and myself were accustomed to speculate much on her age. Was she sixty, or was she six score? We had no precise information. She might have been either. The old lady was surrounded by old-fashioned things. She seemed to live altogether in the past. In her short half-hours of communicativeness, over her second cup of tea, or on the piazza where the poplars sent slim shadows directly toward the east, she used to tell us stories of her alleged ancestors. I say alleged because we never fully believed that she had ancestors. A genealogy is a stupid thing. Here is Aunt Gertrude's, reduced to its simplest forms. Her great-great-grandmother, 1599 to 1642, was a woman of Holland who married a Puritan refugee and sailed from Leyden to Plymouth in the ship Anne in the year of our Lord, 1632. This pilgrim mother had a daughter, Aunt Gertrude's great-grandmother, 1640 to 1718. She came to the eastern district of Massachusetts in the early part of the last century and was carried off by the Indians in the Penobscot Wars. Her daughter, 1680 to 1776, lived to see these colonies free and independent and contributed to the population of the coming republic not less than 19 stalwart sons and comely daughters. One of the latter, 1735 to 1802, married a Wiscasset skipper engaged in the West India trade with whom she sailed. She was twice wrecked at sea, once on what is now Seguin Island, and once on San Salvador. It was on San Salvador that Aunt Gertrude was born. We got to be very tired of hearing this family history. Perhaps it was the constant repetition and the merciless persistency with which the above dates were driven into our young ears that made us skeptics. As I have said, we took little stock in Aunt Gertrude's ancestors, they seemed highly improbable. In our private opinion, the great-grandmothers and grandmothers and so forth were pure myths, and Aunt Gertrude herself was the principal in all the adventures attributed them. Having lasted from century to century while generations of contemporaries went the way of all flesh. On the first landing of the square stairway of the mansion loomed a tall Dutch clock, the case was more than eight feet high, and a dark red wood, not mahogany, and it was curiously inlaid with silver. No common piece of furniture was this. About a hundred years ago there flourished in the town of Brunswick a horologist named Carey, an industrious and accomplished workman. Few well-to-do houses on that part of the coast lacked a Carey timepiece, but Aunt Gertrude's clock had marked the hours and minutes of two full centuries before the Brunswick artisan was born. It was running when William the Taciturn pierced the dikes to relieve Leyden. The name of the maker, Jan Lipperdam, and the date, 1572, were still legible in broad black letters and figures reaching quite across the dial. Carey's masterpieces were plebeian and recent beside this ancient aristocrat. The jolly Dutch moon made to exhibit the phases over a landscape of windmills and polders 
was cunningly painted. A skilled hand had carved the grim ornament at the top, a death's head transfixed by a two-edged sword. Like all timepieces of the sixteenth century, it had no pendulum. A simple Van Wyck escapement governed the descent of the weights to the bottom of the tall case. But these weights never moved. Year after year, when Harry and I returned to Maine, we found the hands of the old clock pointing to the quarter-past three, as they had pointed when we first saw them. The fat moon hung perpetually in the third quarter, as motionless as the death's head above. There was a mystery about the silenced movement and the paralyzed hands. Aunt Gertrude told us that the works had never performed their functions since a bolt of lightning entered the clock, and she showed us a black hole in the side of the case near the top, with a yawning rift that extended downward for several feet. This explanation failed to satisfy us. It did not account for the sharpness of her refusal when we proposed to bring over the watchmaker from the village, or for her singular agitation once she found out, or for her singular agitation once she found Harry on a stepladder, with a borrowed key in his hand, about to test for himself the clock's suspended vitality. One August night, after we had grown out of boyhood, I was awakened by a noise in the hallway. I shook my cousin. "'Somebody's in the house,' I whispered. We crept out of our room and on to the stairs. A dim light came from below. We held breath and noiselessly descended to the second landing. Harry clutched my arm. He pointed down over the banisters, at the same time drawing me back into the shadow. We saw a strange thing. Aunt Gertrude stood on a chair in front of the old clock, as spectral in her white nightgown and white nightcap as one of the poplars when covered with snow. It chanced that the floor creaked slightly under our feet. She turned with a sudden movement, peering intently into the darkness and holding a candle high toward us, so that the light was full upon her pale face. She looked many years older than when I bade her good night. For a few minutes she was motionless, except in the trembling arm that held aloft the candle. Then, evidently reassured, she placed the light upon the shelf and returned again to the clock. We now saw the old lady take a key from behind the face and to proceed to wind up the weights. We could hear her breath quick and short. She rested a band on either side of the case and held her face close to the dial, as if subjecting it to anxious scrutiny. In this attitude she remained for a long time. We heard her utter a sigh of relief, and she half turned toward us for a moment. I shall never forget the expression of wild joy that transfigured her features then. The hands of the clock were moving. They were moving backward. Aunt Gertrude put both arms around the clock and pressed her withered cheek against it. She kissed it repeatedly. She caressed it in a hundred ways, as if it had been a living and beloved thing. She fondled it and talked to it, using words which we could hear but could not understand. The hands continued to move backward. Then she started back with a sudden cry. The clock had stopped. We saw her tall body swaying for an instant on the chair. She stretched out her arms in a convulsive gesture of terror and despair, wrenched the minute hand to its old place at a quarter past three and fell heavily to the floor. Two. Aunt Gertrude's will left me her bank and gas stocks, real estate, railroad bonds, and city sevens, and gave Harry the clock. We thought at the time that this was a very unequal division, the more surprising because my cousin had always seemed to be the favorite. Half in seriousness, we made a thorough examination of the ancient timepiece, sounding its wooden case for secret drawers and even probing the not complicated works with a knitting needle to ascertain if our whimsical relative had bestowed there some codicil or other document changing the aspect of affairs. We discovered nothing. 
There was testamentary provision for our education at the University of Leyden. We left the military school in which we had learned a little of the theory of war and a good deal of the art of standing with our noses over our heels and took ship without delay. The clock went with us. Before many months, it was established in a corner of a room in the Breedstraat. The fabric of Jan Lipperdam's ingenuity, thus restored to its native air, continued to tell the hour of quarter past three with its old fidelity. The author of the clock had been under the sod for nearly three hundred years. The combined skill of his successors in the craft at Leyden could not make it go, neither forward nor backward. We readily picked up enough Dutch to make ourselves understood by the townspeople, the professors, and such of our eight hundred and odd fellow students as came into intercourse. This language, which looks so hard at first, is only a sort of polarized English. Puzzle over it a little while, and it jumps into your comprehension like one of those simple cryptograms made by running together all the words of a sentence and then dividing in the wrong places. The language acquired and the newness of our surroundings worn off, we settled into tolerably regular pursuits. Harry devoted himself with some assiduity to the study of sociology, with a special reference to the round-faced and not unkind maidens of Leyden. I went in for the higher metaphysics. Outside of our respective studies, we had a common ground of unfailing interest. To our astonishment, we found that not one in twenty of the faculty or students knew or cared a sliver about the glorious history of the town, or even about the circumstances under which the university itself was founded by the Prince of Orange. In marked contrast with the general indifference was the enthusiasm of Professor von Stopp, my chosen guide through the cloudiness of speculative philosophy. This distinguished Heglian was a tobacco-dried little old man, with a skull-cap over features that reminded me strangely of Aunt Gertrude's. Had he been her own brother, the facial resemblance could not have been closer. I told him so once, when we were together in the Thadwis, looking at the portrait of the hero of the siege, the Burgomaster van der Werf. The professor laughed. I will show you what is even a more extraordinary coincidence, said he, and leading the way across the hall to the great picture of the siege, by warmers, he pointed out the figure of a burgher participating in the defense. It was true. Von Stopp might have been the burgher's son. The burgher might have been Aunt Gertrude's father. The professor seemed to be fond of us. We often went to his rooms in an old house in the Rappenburgstraat, one of the few houses remaining that antedate 1574. He would walk with us through the beautiful suburbs of the city over the straight roads lined with poplars that carried us back to the bank of the sheepscot in our minds. He took us to the top of the ruined Roman tower in the center of the town, and from the same battlements from which anxious eyes three centuries ago had watched the slow approach of Admiral Boisson's fleet from the submerged polders, he pointed out the great dyke of the Blanchiding, which was cut that the oceans might bring Boissot's Zealanders to raise the leaguer and feed the starving. He showed us the headquarters of the Spaniard Valdez at Lederdorp, and told us how heaven sent a violent northwest wind on the night of the 1st of October, piling up a water deep where it had been shallow, and sweeping the fleet between Zetterwood and Zweiten, up to the very walls of the fort at Lamen, the last stronghold of the besiegers and the last obstacle in the way of succor to the famishing inhabitants. Then he showed us where, on the very night before the retreat of the besieging army, a huge breach was made in the wall of Leyden, near the Cowgate by the Walloons from Lamen. Why, cried Harry, catching fire from the eloquence of the professor's narrative, that was the decisive moment of the siege. The professor said nothing. He stood with his arms folded, looking intently into my cousin's eyes. 
For, continued Harry, had that point not been watched, or had defense rallied and the breach been carried by the right assault from Lamon, the town would have been burned and the people massacred under the eyes of Admiral Bossat in the, and the fleet of relief. Who defended the breach? Von Stopp replied very slowly, as if weighing every word. History records the explosion of the mine under the city wall on the last night of the siege. It does not tell the story of the defense or give the defender's name. Yet no man that ever lived had a more tremendous charge than fate entrusted to this unknown hero. Was it chance that sent him to meet that unexpected danger? Consider some of the consequences had he failed. The fall of Leyden would have destroyed the last hope of the Prince of Orange and of the Free States. The tyranny of Philip would have been re-established. The birth of religious liberty and of self-government by the people would have been postponed. Who knows for how many centuries? Who knows that there would be or could have been a republic of the United States of America had there been no United Netherlands? Our university, which has given to the world Grotius, Scaliger, Arminius, and Descartes, was founded upon this hero's successful defense of the breach. We owe to him our presence here today. Nay, you owe to him your very existence. Your ancestors were of Leyden. Between their lives and the butchers outside the walls, he stood that night. The little professor towered before us, a giant of enthusiasm and patriotism. Harry's eyes glistened and his cheeks reddened. Go home, boys, said Von Stopp, and thank God that while the burghers of Leyden were straining their gaze toward Zutterwood and the fleet, there was one pair of vigilant eyes and one stout heart at the town wall just beyond the cow gate. 3. The rain was splashing against the windows one evening in the autumn of our third year at Leyden when Professor Van Stopp honored us with a visit in the Breedstraat. Never had I seen the old gentleman in such spirits. He talked incessantly. The gossip of the town, the news of Europe, science, poetry, philosophy, were in turn touched upon and treated with the same high and good humor. I sought to draw him out on Hegel, with whose chapter on the complexity and interdependency of things I was just then struggling. You do not grasp the return of the itself into itself through its other self, he said, smiling. Well, you will sometime. Harry was silent and preoccupied. His taciturnity gradually affected even the professor. The conversation flagged, and we sat a long while without a word. Now and then there was a flash of lightning succeeded by distant thunder. "'Your clock does not go,' suddenly remarked the professor. "'Does it ever go?' "'Never since we can remember,' I replied. "'That is, only once, and then it went backward. It was when Aunt Gertrude—' Here I caught a warning glance from Harry. I laughed and stammered. The clock is old and useless. It cannot be made to go. Only backward, said the professor, calmly and not appearing to notice my embarrassment. Well, and why should not a clock go backward? Why should not time itself turn and retrace its course? He seemed to be waiting for an answer. I had none to give. I thought you Hegelian enough, he continued, to admit that every condition includes its own contradiction. Time is a condition, not an essential. Viewed from the absolute, the sequence by which future follows present and present follows past, is purely arbitrary. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, there is no reason in the nature of things why the order should not be tomorrow today, yesterday. A sharper peal of thunder interrupted the professor's speculations. 
The day is made by the planet's revolution on its axis from west to east. I fancy you can conceive conditions under which it might turn from east to west, unwinding, as it were, the revolutions of past ages. Is it so much more difficult to imagine time unwinding itself, time on the ebb instead of on the flow, the past unfolding as the future recedes, the centuries counter-marching, the course of events proceeding toward the beginning and not, as now, toward the end? But, I interposed, we know that as far as we are concerned, the... We know exclaimed von Stopp, with growing scorn. Your intelligence has no wings. You follow in the trail of Comte and his slimy brood of creepers and crawlers. You speak with amazing assurance of your position in the universe. You seem to think that your wretched little individuality has a firm foothold in the absolute. Yet you go to bed tonight and dream into existence men women, children, beasts of the past or of the future. How do you know that at this moment you yourself, with all your conceit of nineteenth-century thought, are anything more than a creature of a dream of the future, dreamed, let us say, by some philosopher of the sixteenth century? How do you know that you are anything more than a creature of a dream of the past, dreamed by some Hegelian of the 26th century. How do you know, boy, that you will not vanish into the 16th century, or 2060, the moment the dreamer awakes? There was no replying to this, for it was sound metaphysics. Harry yawned. I got up and went to the window. Professor von Stopp approached the clock. Ah, uh, my children, said he, there is no fixed progress of human events. Past, present, and future are woven together in one inextricable mesh. Who shall say that this old clock is not right to go backward? A crash of thunder shook the house. The storm was over our heads. When the blinding glare had passed away, Professor Van Stopp was standing upon a chair before the tall timepiece. His face looked more than ever like Aunt Gertrude's. He stood as she had stood in that last quarter of an hour when we saw her wind the clock. The same thought struck Harry and myself. Hold, we cried, and he began to wind the works. It may be death if you... The professor's sallow features shone with the strange enthusiasm that had transformed Aunt Gertrude's. True, he said, it may be death, but it may be the awakening, past, present, future, all woven together. The shuttle goes to and fro, forward and back. He had wound the clock. The hands were whirling around the dial from right to left with inconceivable rapidity. In this whirl we ourselves seem to be borne along. Eternities seem to contract into minutes while lifetimes were thrown off at every tick. Van Stopp, both arms outstretched, was reeling in his chair. The house shook again under a tremendous peal of thunder. At the same instant a ball of fire, leaving a wake of sulfurous vapor and filling the room with dazzling light, passed over our heads and smote the clock. Van Stopp was prostrated. The hands ceased to revolve. 4. The roar of the thunder sounded like a heavy cannonading. The lightning's blaze appeared as the steady light of a conflagration. With our hands over our eyes, Harry and I rushed out into the night. Under a red sky, people were hurrying toward the Stadtwitz, Flames in the direction of the Roman tower told us that the heart of the town was afire. The faces of those we saw were haggard and emaciated. From every side we caught disjointed phrases of complaint or despair. Horseflesh at ten shillings a pound, said one, 
and bread at sixteen shillings. Bread indeed, an old woman retorted. It's eight weeks gone since I've seen a crumb. My little grandchild, the lame one, went last night. Do you know what Gekabechi, the washerwoman, did? She was starving. Her babe died, and she and her man... A louder cannon burst cut short this revelation. We made our way on toward the citadel of the town, passing a few soldiers here and there, and many burghers with grim faces under their broad-brimmed felt hats. There is bread plenty yonder where the gunpowder is, and full pardon, too. Valdez shot another amnesty over the walls this morning. An excited crowd immediately surrounded the speaker. But the fleet, they cried. The fleet is grounded fast on the Greenway Polder. Boissot may turn his one eye seaward for a wind till famine and pestilence have carried off every mother's son of ye, and his ark will not be a rope's length nearer. Death by plague, death by starvation, death by fire and musketry. That is what the burgomaster offers us in return for glory for himself and kingdom for orange. He asks us, said a sturdy citizen, to hold out only twenty-four hours longer, and to pray meanwhile for an ocean wind. Ah, yes, sneered the first speaker. Pray on. There is bread enough locked in Peter Adrian's und van der Werf's cellar. I warrant you that it is what gives him so wonderful a stomach for resisting the most Catholic king. A young girl with braided yellow hair pressed through the crowd and confronted the malcontent. Good people, said the maiden, do not listen to him. He is a traitor with a Spanish heart. I am Pieter's daughter. We have no bread. We ate malt cakes and rapeseed like the rest of you till that was gone. Then we stripped the green leaves from the lime trees and willows in our gardens and ate them. We have eaten even the thistles and weeds that grew between the stones by the canal. The coward lies. Nevertheless, the insinuation had its effect. The throng, now become a mob, surged off in the direction of the burgomaster's house. One ruffian raised his hand to strike the girl out of the way. In a wink, the cur was under the feet of his fellows, and Harry, panting and glowing, stood at the maiden's side, shouting defiance in good English at the backs of the rapidly retreating crowd. With the utmost frankness, she put both her arms around Harry's neck and kissed him. "'Thank you,' she said. "'You are a hearty lad. My name is Gertrude Vanderwert. Harry was fumbling in his vocabulary for the proper Dutch phrases, but the girl would not stay for compliments. They mean mischief to my father. And she hurried us through several exceedingly narrow streets into a three-cornered marketplace dominated by a church with two spires. There he is, she exclaimed, on the steps of St. Pancras. There was a tumult in the marketplace, the conflagration raging beyond the church, and the voices of the Spanish and Walloon cannon outside the walls were less angry than the roar of this multitude of desperate men clamoring for the bread that a single word from their leader's lips would bring them. "'Surrender to the king!' they cried, or "'We will send your dead body to Lamon as Leyden's token of submission!' One tall man, taller by half a head than any of the burghers confronting him, and so dark of complexion that we wondered how he could be the father of Gertrude, heard the threat in silence. When the burgomaster spoke, the mob listened in spite of themselves. "'What is it you ask, my friends, that we break our vow and surrender laden to the Spaniards, that is to devote ourselves to a fate far more horrible than starvation? I have to keep the oath. Kill me if you will have it so. I can die only once, whether by your hands, by the enemies, or by the hand of God. Let us starve if we must, welcoming starvation, because it comes before dishonor. Your menaces do not move me. My life is at your disposal. Here, take my sword, thrust it into my breast, and divide my flesh among you to appease your hunger. So long as I remain alive, expect no surrender. There was silence again while the mob wavered. Then there were mutterings around us. Above these rang out the clear voice of the girl, whose hand Harry still held unnecessarily, it seemed to me. Do you not feel the sea wind? It has come at last, to the tower, and the first man there will see by moonlight the full white sails of the prince's ships. 
For several hours I scoured the streets of the town, seeking in vain my cousin and his companion. The sudden movement and the crowd toward the Roman tower had separated us. On every side I saw evidences of the terrible chastisement that had brought this stout-hearted people to the verge of despair. A man with hungry eyes chased a lean rat along the bank of the canal. A young mother with two dead babes in her arms sat in a doorway to which they bore the bodies of her husband and father, just killed at the walls. In the middle of the deserted street I passed unburied corpses in a pile twice as high as my head. The pestilence had been there, kinder than the Spaniard, because it held out no treacherous promises while it dealt its blows. Toward morning the wind increased to a gale. There was no sleep in Leyden. No more talk of surrender. No longer any thought or care about defense. These words were on the lips of everybody I met. Daylight will bring the fleet. Did daylight bring the fleet? History says so, but I was not a witness. I know only that before dawn the gale culminated in a violent thunderstorm, and that at the same time a muffled explosion, heavier than the thunder, shook the town. I was in the crowd that watched from the Roman mound for the first signs of the approaching relief. The concussion shook hope out of every face. Their mine has reached the wall. But where? I pressed forward until I found the burgomaster, who was standing among the rest. Quick, I whispered. It is beyond the cow gate, and this side of the Tower of Burgundy. He gave me a searching glance and then strode away without making any attempt to quiet the general panic. I followed close at his heels. It was a tight run of nearly half a mile to the rampart in question. When we reached the cow gate, this is what we saw. A great gap where the wall had been, opening to the swampy fields beyond. In the moat outside and below, a confusion of upturned faces, belonging to men who struggled like demons to achieve the breach who now gained a few feet and now were forced back. On the shattered rampart a handful of soldiers and burghers formed a living wall where masonry had failed. Perhaps a double handful of women and girls serving stones to the defenders and boiling water in buckets, besides pitch and oil and unslaked lime and some of them quoiting tarred and burning hoops over the necks of the Spaniards in the moat. My cousin Harry leading and directing the men, the burgomaster's daughter Gertrude, encouraging and inspiring the women. But what attracted my attention more than anything else was the frantic activity of a little figure in black who with a huge ladle was showering molten lead on the heads of the assailing party. As he turned to the bonfire and kettle which supplied him with ammunition, his features came into full light. I gave a cry of surprise. The ladler of molten lead was Professor Van Stopp. The burgomaster of Vanderwerf turned at my sudden exclamation. Who is that, I said, the man at the kettle? That, replied Vanderwerf, is the brother of my wife, the clockmaker, Jan Lipperdam. The affair at the breach was over almost before we had time to grasp the situation. The Spaniards who had overthrown the wall of brick and stone found the living wall impregnable. They could not even maintain their position in the moat. They were driven off into the darkness. Now I felt a sharp pain in my left arm. Some stray missile must have hit me while we watched the fight. "'Who has done this thing?' demanded the burgomaster. "'Who is it that has kept watch on today while the rest of us were straining fools' eyes toward tomorrow?' Gertrude Vanderwerf came forward proudly, leading my cousin. My father, said the girl, he has saved my life. That is much to me, said the burgomaster, but it is not all. He has saved Leyden, and he has saved Holland. I was becoming dizzy. The faces around me seemed unreal. Why were we here with these people? Why did the thunder and lightning forever continue? Why did the clockmaker, Jan Lipperdam, turn always toward me, the face of Professor von Stopp. Harry, I said, come back to our rooms. 
But though he grasped my hand warmly, his other hand still held that of the girl, and he did not move. Then nausea overcame me, my head swam, and the breach and its defenders faded from sight. Five. Three days later, I sat with one arm bandaged in my accustomed seat in Van Stopp's lecture room. The place beside me was vacant. We hear much, said the Hegelian professor, reading from a notebook in his usual dry, hurried tone, of the influence of the sixteenth century upon the nineteenth. No philosopher, as far as I am aware, has studied the influence of the nineteenth century upon the sixteenth. If cause produces effect, does effect never induce cause? Does the law of heredity, unlike all other laws of this universe of mind and matter, operate in one direction only? Does the descendant owe everything to the ancestor, and the ancestor nothing to the descendant? Does destiny, which may seize upon our existence for its own purposes, bear us far into the future, never carry us back into the past? I went back to my rooms in the Bredestraat, where my only companion was the silent clock. End of the Clock That Went Backward <laughs>